So we're working on deriving exponential and logarithmic functions. We've only learned one so far, and that is the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. We've done a couple examples. Let's do a couple more. So I have my fifth example here. Um, this one is the most complicated because it combines the most rules. In this one, we, of course, have the quotient rule because there's a division. But we also have a chain rule within e to the x because it is e to the something other than just x. But we saw an example of using the chain rule of e to the x in the last video, and so we're just going to be doing the same thing now. All right, my first rule that I'm going to emphasize is the quotient rule. And so we have f prime of x is equal to the original of the denominator times the derivative of the numerator. Well, that's where I'm going to utilize my chain rule. So I have the derivative of the outside is just e to the negative 3x is itself times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of the inside or the derivative of my power is negative 3. Now back to my quotient rule, minus the original of the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, very simply, 2x all over the denominator squared. So now I have to do is simplify this. In the top, I have a negative 3e to the negative 3x times x squared plus 1, which I can distribute if I need to, minus 2x times e to the negative 3x. Denominator, I could FOIL it out, but I don't think that's going to gain me any ground, so I'll leave it as is. Now, if I look at my two parts, so this being a part and this being a part, I see that both of these have an e to the negative 3x in common. If you're having a hard time separating this here, understandable, what you might do instead is to take a separate step and to distribute that through, and then it would be easier to maybe pull it out and see what's actually happening there. But I'm going to skip that step and just pull it out as once. So I have e to the negative 3x times negative 3 with the x squared plus 1 minus 2x. Course denominator still stays the same. So I can simplify a little bit in the brackets by now distributing that negative 3. And so I have my derivative is equal to e to the negative 3x times negative 3x squared minus 3 minus 2x, and all over x squared plus 1 squared. And so you can see that we've utilized combining a lot of rules there, the e to the x rule, the quotient rule, and the chain rule, and of course all the other little rules that goes along with it. So my last example of the derivative of e to the x is finding the largest and the smallest values. So somewhat similarly to finding the maximum and the minimum, but this one is bounded for us. It actually gives us an interval that we're looking at. And so if I don't see a high point or a low point on that interval, it's possible that one of my high points and one of my low points could be the actual end values. So we're going to treat this just like by finding a maximum and minimum value first, and then when we do our test values on the number line, we're also going to have to test the endpoints of our number line. Okay, so first thing first, to find the maximum or minimum of anything, we need to take the derivative. This utilizes a product rule and a chain rule. So I suggest that you pause the video to see if you can finish up this example on your own. So first step is to take my derivative. My product rule says the original of the second times the derivative of the first, where the derivative of x is 1, plus the original of the first times the derivative of the second. The derivative of e is just e itself. The derivative of my power using my chain rule is 2. So this gives me e to the 2x plus 2x times e to the 2x. 
Now if I know I want to maximize or minimize this, I'm going to want to set it equal to zero, which means I want to simplify it as far as possible. So let me factor out an e to the 2x. That leaves me with 1 plus 2x. And then, of course, I'm going to set that equal to zero. So I have my first factor of e to the 2x is equal to zero, and then my second factor of 1 plus 2x is equal to zero. Well, in my first equation here, I know I'm going to take natural log of both sides to cancel out this. So my left-hand side very easily cancels out. My right-hand side, what is the natural log of zero? Well, hopefully you recall that the natural log of zero is undefined. It doesn't make sense because when we looked at the graph of log functions, they had a vertical asymptote at zero, so I cannot plug in zero to the function. So this part does not have any solution whatsoever. So let me solve this other one over here. Skipping a couple of steps, we get x is equal to negative one half. So this is my possible critical value, my possible maximum or minimum, but remember I'm bounded by this interval. So I need to plot my interval where it goes from negative one to positive one, Confirm that this number is on it, it is for sure, and then I need to test my points in between. We always want to test them in the most factored form of my derivative, and so that's going to be easy to test for positives and negatives. And so let us first test negative 3, 4. And then for our second interval here, I can test 0. So I'm going to be plugging them in my highlighted part here, e to the 2x times 1 plus 2x. Let me plug in negative 3 fourths first. I'm going to plug it into the second portion first because it's easier for us to compute. 2 times negative 3 fourths gives me negative 1 and a half plus 1 gives me a negative value. And then e to the 2 times negative 3 fourths. Well, you should know that any time you plug anything into an exponential function, it's guaranteed to be positive because the range of my exponential functions were 0 to infinity. So it's guaranteed to be positive. Okay, so positive times negative gives me negative. So that tells me that this part over here is decreasing. Now, if I plug in 0, I get e to the 2 times 0, which gives me 1. Of course, it's positive. I knew it had to be. And then over here, that's going to give me a positive. So that gives me this here. So when I'm looking for the largest and the smallest values, this graph right here gives me my smallest value. So the smallest is most definitely when x is equal to negative 1 half. But the question becomes is when is the largest? Since this is bounded by an interval, my largest either has to happen over here on the left-hand side or over here on the right-hand side. So we just need to plug these values back into my original function to see which one of them gives us the actual largest value. So if I do f of negative 1, that gives me negative 1 times e to the 2 times negative 1. I can type this in my calculator if I want, but I know that I'm going to end up with a negative exponent here. And I'm going to hold off on that for a moment. We'll come back in a second. Now if I plug in positive 1, that gives me positive 1 times e to the 2 times 1, or 1 e to the 2. Now, I know that both of these e's are guaranteed to be positive just because of the range. The range is between 0 and infinity. So that means this one here, since it's positive, has got to come up to be a positive value. This one here is negative, so that means it's got to come out to be a negative value. So since this one is positive, that means it's got to have the largest value. And so my largest value is when x is equal to 1. If you don't trust yourself, 
You are always more than welcome to graph these and confirm that you have the correct answer. So I graphed this at Desmos. We can see over here my function, y equals x e to the 2x, and you can see that I have this here. And we know that this is bounded by the interval between negative 1 and 1. And so maybe I want to tell my graph that. So I want my interval to go between negative 1 and 1. So now my x value goes between negative 1 and 1. So if we wanted to see the largest value, we can clearly see that our largest value is happening over here on the right, so that's obvious. And then we see that the graph dips down a little bit down here, and so that's going to tell us where our minimum value is. And so if we look at the x value of that, our minimum value is negative 0.5. And so we have confirmed that this is our minimum value at negative 1 half, and that over here, is our maximum value at x equal 1. So we've confirmed the correct answer on our appropriate interval. So the steps are exactly the same as they were before of finding maximums and minimums. Take the derivative, set it equal to 0, test those values in the number line, look for where we're switching from increasing to decreasing and vice versa. The only thing that changed here is if it's bounded by an interval, you might have to check your endpoints of your interval to see how they compare with the rest of the graph.